Good morning, everybody, and thank you for uh, coming to our special Grand Round series, the Jackson and Milliam and DCI Endowed Lecture Series. Um, we are really grateful to both Dr. Yim and Millie for helping us set this endowment. Um, I've known Dr. Yim for many years, uh, got to know him in 1994, but um, he's had, as we all know, a very distinguished and long career at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, here in the Department of Medicine, the community, and, of course, Erlanger Health System. He started in 1973 and um, has held uh, academic uh, positions in the Department of Medicine. He was appointed director of nephrology and the hemodialysis unit at Erlanger Medical Center and the dialysis clinic in Chattanooga in 1973. He has served many roles both at the university and at Erlanger, um, some notable ones being professor of medicine, head of nephrology section, and the co-director of the resident Erlanger Regional Kidney Transplant Center. He's had multiple recognitions as outstanding teaching uh, physician, faculty member over the years. He was recognized as the best doctor in America and the Southeast region among uh, America's top 100 physicians in nephrology in 2004. He was actually the founding member of the Ethics Committee at Erlanger and was awarded the Augustus McCravey MD Award in recognition of a lifetime of excellence in medical education in 2007. That is a prestigious award indeed. Though he retired in 2013, he continued uh, to be the lifelong educator and learner he is. He used to help us in the uh, outpatient clinic, precepting residents, continues to do community work today. As his wife, uh, Millie, contributes a lot to the community, so we are really grateful for both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to really uh, introduce Dr. Coco now, who uh, is uh, one of the faculty in the Department of Nephrology and really in the uh, section of uh, renal transplant, uh, to introduce our esteemed speaker today, Dr. Newell. All right, good morning. Uh, again, I'd like to recognize Dr. Hume. Uh, thank you very much for putting this together and for all the years of service that you've done. Most of you realize that he was one of the transplant nephrologists who helped found the program here with uh, Dr. Fisher. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ken Newell to you all today. Ken and I have known each other a long time. I was a starting faculty at Emory in 2001 when he first came from the University of Chicago as a bright-eyed and slightly hairier version of himself at the time and then has rose through the academic ranks. I could spend time going through all the accolades that he's achieved, but he's been president of the American Society of Transplant, has held numerous NIH grants, R01, had research labs, has published many papers. And all those accolades are great, but they, they really don't define the man. You know, when you, when you think about uh, people and their impacts in the uh, medicine community, one thing is what they do academically, but the other is people's lives that they touch. He's been uh, very involved in fellowship training programs on the surgery side. Um, he's with his work through the American Society of Transplant with the number of fellows and residents that he's taught and touched and from the patient lives. He's really done a tremendous impact at Emory. And when he first came, our program ended up in a little bit of a disarray. And he and I struggled. And he put together the Living Donor Program at Emory and has really built it to be one of the premier programs in the country. And uh, Emory's doing, what, over 250 kidneys? A year now, and it's just it's huge. They do all the pair donors exchange program, which he started, and so it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, one of my great friends uh, at Emory, uh, Dr. Kendall. Thank you, Ken. Um, somebody once said one of my mentors. You remember these things? He said the problem, Ken, is when people look at you on paper, they'll be expecting something great, and then you'll show up and they'll be disappointed. So <laughs> it's always nice to start on a high note, anyway. I want to thank the Humes. I had prepared some comments. I'm going to skip those for the sake of brevity and that they've been kind of touched on. But I, you can find amazing things from the Internet, and it's a real legacy of the contributions, I think, to Chattanooga, to the university, and the healthcare system. And so I really appreciate them um, sponsoring me today. I was also a little intimidated when I discovered at dinner last night that the first Hume lecture was given by Bob Gaston one of my colleagues and a uh, renowned nephrologist from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. 
So I'm going to apologize in advance. I've got too many slides. I'm going to cover some of them quickly. They're mostly talking points not to be dwelled on. I do have a few disclosures, always looking for more. None of these, however, have anything to do with what I'm talking about today. Um, the real tension in living kidney donation is kind of factors that are opposing each other. There's a tremendous need. High rate of ESRD, a lot of patients on dialysis, huge waiting list, not that many donors, not that many transplants. Then there's disparities to access. We're going to talk about that. So not everybody has an equal shot at getting a kidney transplant. And then there are risks to the donor. So you've got all those things, you know, and then there's autonomy. And I didn't discover this until later. I would go in and I'd say, well, I think the right thing for you is this, and then we'd decide that. And now I've come to decide that the donor should have a little more voice in the decision about whether or not they should <laughs> proceed with donation as long as they understand the risks, and that's the real kicker. So this slide I could add another year, I think, but um, the bottom line is when I started, I started my fellowship right around here, and it looked like living donation was going to be the solution to the organ shortage, or at least a big component of it. Then it kind of flattened out, and we'll talk about why. Um, we thought this was due to the introduction of less invasive surgical techniques. Probably not. The trend had already preceded it. I think certainly the uh, financial downturn had something to do with why living donation kind of plateaued, and we'll come back to that, although that's not the sole reason. The other thing is that the donor demographics are changing. If you go back and look, we now have older donors, less related donors, heavier donors, and so kind of the, you know, concept of the 35-year-old who's perfectly healthy, you know, coming in and donating to their brother has kind of vanished, at least in Emory, or not vanished, but it's less frequent. So um, a lot of this is now driven by unrelated donors in paired exchange. I was going to try to talk about that, but it just, I don't have time for it today, but I think that is one of the kind of shining stars of living donation at the moment. So we're going to talk about disincentives, and there's many things I think might discourage people from proceeding with donation today. So one is new insights into medical risk. So when I started at Emory, all the papers had been published, largely from Minnesota, looking at Caucasians who donated back in the 70s and 80s, said living donors outlive regular people, and they have a lower risk of kidney disease than the general population which would imply that every one of you should rush out and donate a kidney to live longer and avoid seeing Ken on dialysis. That can't make sense, right? And the problem gets to the control group or the comparison group. You know, general people, are, or the general population isn't as healthy as a whole as living donors. So what's a living donor's risk of medical complications or problems down the road relative to a perfectly matched healthy person? And these two papers came out and they were pretty sobering. And I remember there were great debates at our transplant meetings about flaws in the methodology and where it wasn't really that bad and maybe this wasn't true. But the truth of it is, I think we all accept now that being a living kidney donor, regardless of who you are, increases your lifetime risk of kidney failure. And these papers were the first. Um, and it pointed out, and I think this was overlooked initially, not everybody's the same. So if we all donate, everybody in this room, we don't all have the same risk of kidney disease down the road. Um, age is a factor, we're going to talk about that, gender certainly, um, race, and then the relationship to the recipient in this first study were all pointed out as things that influenced individual risk. Morgan Grahams, um, also from Johns Hopkins, um, the first paper was, uh, the senior author was Dory Segev, so then they did a follow-on study where they were trying to predict risk, so going from just measuring risk to predicting it. Again. The lowest risk group of donors, Caucasian females, highest African-American males. Um, and the risk is somewhere around 3.5 to 5.3-fold increased lifetime risk of CKD, ESRD, um, after, or attributable to living donation. And so I think I've actually seen even higher spreads. In some selected groups, it can go up over 10 per, or, uh, tenfold. So who is it? Well, not surprisingly, kidney function going into it matters, right? If, I mean, I can't believe there are actually any living donors that started with GFRs less than 60, but apparently that's possible. Um, so impaired renal function pre-donation predicts risk, systolic blood pressure, use of antihypertensive drugs, 
non-insulin dependent diabetes and even gestational diabetes will shake out. Uh, obesity defined as a BMI greater than 30, and in our practice, I mean, that's kind of normal now. Um, smoking status and proteinuria. So you can begin to look at all these things and predict people's individual risk. I think this is um, overlooked often. So a lot of people talk about 15-year projected incidence because it's impossible to do long-term studies in donors, or not impossible, but it's been difficult. So when you look at this, you say, ah, age doesn't have that big a factor. If you look at a 30-year-old, difference, you know, based on your ethnicity and your gender is pretty tight, right? Not a huge difference. But what we really ought to be looking is, I think, lifetime risk. And here, what you see is the young people, you see a real splay. So Bob Steiner has, for years, he's a nephrologist at UCSF, has been an advocate. We always used to say, you know, the perfect donor is somebody who comes home from college, you know, they're a sophomore, want to donate to their dad, and they're always healthy. They always look good. But that's the group that should really scare us, because you're looking at projecting 65 years down the road. We have no data about that. You know, I think actually the perfect donor now is me, 60 years old, pretty healthy. I've determined, you know, my composition, my habits, my health, and most of the things that are going to cause trouble down the road, I probably won't live long enough to run into trouble. So I think the field has changed a little bit to favoring the healthy, somewhat older donor over these uh, apparently healthy uh, younger donors with long-term risk. From that, they came up with a calculator. So this is a kind of useful tool. Now this is pre-donation risk, but pre-donation risk of CKD and ESRD probably is a pretty good predictor of post-donation risk. Um, so you can plug all this in and you can begin to have conversations with people. So instead of just saying your risk is increased and using a generic number, you can begin to talk to them and you can begin to look at things that are potentially modifiable. And so Tony Guash, one of uh, my colleagues and Ken's former colleague at Emory is a big proponent of, you know, your risk today isn't what your risk is afterwards. If we can change your lifestyle, if you can lose weight, you can exercise, you can improve your glycemic control, you can improve your blood pressure, then your risk may change. But I think that we need to increasingly start relying on tools like this so that we can have real conversations so that people understand their risk. Because I can tell you, half of the people I see you go in there and they're just like, yeah, I've already decided I'm going to do it. You tell me whatever. And they don't hear a single word you say. And I think those are the scariest uh, patients. So when you try to lump all the studies together, what really shakes out is there's no difference in survival attributable to living kidney donation. So it doesn't affect overall longevity. It does affect, as we said, end-stage renal disease. No real impact on cardiovascular disease. The real problem is eclampsia, uh, preeclampsia, gestational uh, diabetes, and hypertension. So the real risk is right around here. And this is particularly important, obviously, for younger women who still want to have children. I'd say that's the second most powerful effect after the effect on CKD. And quality of life for living donors, it probably says something about them, is generally the same or better in most studies than um, their matched controls. So when you try to reduce this to something you can do in a billable amount of time in the clinic, I think this is a nice way to look at it. Your risk if you're 20 years old of developing kidney disease lifetime is about 1 in 50. At 40 years old, 1 in 75, and at 60 years old, 1 in 150. So that's a number that people can grasp. You know, I, I've never understood, you know, your risk is 10 out of 10,000 patient years. I, I, I don't even know how to use that. So I don't think it's probably very useful for patients. But this is understandable. When you think about it from the recipient side, not all living donor kidneys are the same. So Dory Segev from Johns Hopkins, and they have a long um, history of studying living donation, um, came up with, if you're familiar with the kidney donor risk index, you take um, donor factors such as age, race, um, cause of death, and you factor that in, and you can predict basically kidney longevity. It's not perfect. The C statistic's about 0.7, but it's not bad. Well, Dory did something similar for living donors. And you see there is some overlap. So some living donors don't actually score as well as deceased donors. So this is the, and lower is better. Here you want to be one, 100 is bad. So this is the living donor 
risk index superimposed over the deceased donor risk index. Then you can see that most living donors are better than deceased donors, but not all. And then this just shows, you know, the better uh, the kidneys predicted to last longer actually last longer. And so this is really helpful also in paired exchange where, you know, your son comes in to donate to you and they pair you up with someone's grandmother who is donating to them. You can kind of use this tool to say, are these kidneys equivalent as far as the benefit they convert, confer to the recipient? From the recipient standpoint, what happens if you get a kidney from somebody who goes on to develop ESRD? Well, not surprisingly, your risk of graft loss and death is substantially higher, saying that the quality of the kidney really does impact the longevity and your longevity. When you look at why kidneys fail, it probably shouldn't be so surprising, but this is a paper from the group at the University of Minnesota, Art Matus and his colleagues. Um, they were one of the first centers to living donors. There is a caveat here, although they looked at 4,000 donors, they're almost, they're 99% Caucasian, largely of Scandinavian origin, and a lot of these people donated in an era where their health is substantially different than the health of people we see in Atlanta today. With that caveat aside, they had 39 that developed kidney failure. The uh, important thing is it was on average 27 years after they donated. So, you know, it's not so hard to avoid people who are going to develop kidney failure, you know, three, four, five years after they donate. We ought to be able to largely um, screen those people out. But this is the problem. It also tells you that it's really hard to do studies. If Ken and I, when we met at Emory in 2001, said we must study living donors starting now, you know, we'd be retired by the time we had enough data to write a paper. Um, so again, the risk in their cohort was males, younger people, smokers, donating to first degree relatives. Half of it was diabetes and hypertension, which I think we'll come to a little later in the talk, but is a great concern. There were only two cases, you know, you always hear about, well, you only have one kidney and if you're in a car accident, that kidney gets down. That practically doesn't happen. Renal cell carcinomas caused two of the uh, nephrectomies resulting in people developing kidney failure. In four cases, it was the same etiology as the recipient. We'll talk about that a little bit. And the real sobering thing is that their GFR was stable right until something happened, and then the decline started. So again, you know, we now, like everybody, follow patients for two years. And if they're looking good at two years, we say, go see your doctor and let us know if there's a problem. It's not a very good strategy. I'll talk about that a little bit. I feel strongly that's not the right approach. Uh, there's a woman Ken may remember donated to her father, a real vascular path. He died within the first year from cardiac disease. Um, she worked as a file clerk at Grady. She did well for eight years, and then she started presenting to the ER. Well, she had two pregnancies complicated by uh, preeclampsia, developed hypertension, started presenting to the ER with headaches, uncontrolled high blood pressure. And that's nicely documented by the hospitalists in the medical record, her deterioration of kidney function and progression to kidney failure. But she had a stone cold normal creatinine out to eight years. So following people for two years doesn't do a lot of good necessarily. Um, this is a study where they tried to look at causes. And what you can see here, the bottom line is early uh, recurrence of, or early occurrence of like glomerular nephritis, things like that, things that are likely perhaps genetic in origin, or at least contribute, that, that's the early causes. So I donate to my brother, and I end up with the same thing he does, and I end up on dialysis. And then there's the late onset, which is mostly diabetes and hypertension. Um, so I talked a little bit about how we've changed. Some of the growth in living kidney donation is without a doubt us accepting patients that our mentors and their mentors would not have considered acceptable candidates. I think when you start doing this, the concept of the perfectly healthy living donor, well, it's easy. You can be a donor if you're perfectly healthy. That doesn't really exist. We have people who smoke. We have people who have hypercholesterolemia. I mean, we have people with some, we see on CTs, you know, vascular calcifications. Those are not perfectly healthy people, yet we let them donate, and we increasingly push the boundaries. Um, so this is a paper from a few years ago, and I'd argue we do it more now, where a quarter of all donors were considered medically complex. By that, these guys defined it as obesity, hypertension, or low GFR. Um, so that's a substantial group of people. The good news is the same group of authors showed that if you look at older donors who you might consider complex, 
the risk of cardiovascular events was no different. So that suggests, again, that perhaps by older, I'm now in that group solidly, um, you know, is a group that we shouldn't perhaps be as afraid of as we once were. This is a paper from a group in Australia. And these were their, what they considered relative or absolute contraindications, so GFR less than 80, significant proteinuria, hypertension, especially on multiple drugs, obesity, and uh, impaired glucose uh, tolerance. And so when they looked, what they saw is that it varied hugely by program how many relative or absolute contraindications you accepted. So there's a real spectrum, and I think we see that in the U.S. There are very conservative programs where here the majority of the patients had no contraindications versus here everybody had something. And so I think that, you know, unfortunately we all look at the same data, but how we interpret it and how we, you know, use that data in decision making is very different. And I think if you look, there really aren't any standards or clear recommendations from societies or groups. KDGO has some guidelines, but people pretty much ignore those as well. And I think um, it's a kind of slippery slope as I talk to Ken and he's like, oh, we do this all the time and we feel good about it. And then I'm like, well, I can do it. And soon then I extend that a little bit and we just all start kind of liberalizing our criteria. And the real problem is there's no follow-up. For most of this stuff, there's no data where I can really tell these people what their lifetime risk is. Um, when you look at the impact of uh, medically complex donors, um, the things that determine the donor risk are kidney function, age, hypertension, glucose intolerance, BMI, proteinuria, and small kidney size. Then there's a whole series of things that are different that impact the outcome for the recipient. So it just goes to show you that when you're looking at risk factors in a donor, there are those that impact them, but then there are those that impact the recipient, and they're not necessarily the same. Um, another, though, fairly reassuring thing, this is a study from the group at Mayo Clinic in Rochester looking at compensatory hypertrophy. So it would make sense if you remove somebody's kidney that their GFR should fall by about 50%. That's a short-term thing. The other kidney will rapidly hypertrophy, increase in function, and you'll end up with about a 30% decline in function relative to where you started. And uh, what this paper showed is that when you took these complex donors, the obese people, the smokers, the hypertensive people, their kidney, the older donors, their kidneys hypertrophied at the same rate as the younger ideal donor. So at least we're starting in a good position. When you look at why centers do decline donors, a lot of it has to do with the things we've talked about, the things that increased risk. So what's the data around that? This is a paper from uh, David when he was at UCSF looking at pre-diabetic donors. And they followed them only for about five years, but they saw no difference in proteinuria uh, or GFR. And so that was fairly reassuring, but again, you know, when you think about pre-diabetics, the progression to diabetes, and the progression to kidney injury, you're not likely to see a difference. So if you had, it would have been pretty worrisome. But this is the type of data that people use to say, oh, well, then we can do this safely, and I uh, put it to you that that's not a true um, conclu or a valid conclusion. Here's a group that went a little further. They actually took people with diabetes and allowed them to donate. And again, with fairly short follow-up, saw no difference in GFR, proteinuria, things like that. Um, that said, again, I, I have reservations about that. This looks at patients who develop diabetes after donation. So that person who has impaired glucose tolerance or impaired glucose uh, homeostasis who does develop diabetes, and you can see a stacking effect. Diabetes with hypertension and proteinuria is the worst group. And so, you know, it's a little hard to predict who's going to develop both diabetes and hypertension, but that's the population I think is really at risk. And this just shows that, again, up until the event, everybody looks pretty good. Then there's some event, some trigger that causes a decline that progresses. So um, this is a summary, an invited paper, where they said, what do we do about uh, hypertension in kidney donors? And Stephen Texter, Bob Gaston tells the story, he was uh, assigned a debate at the American Transplant Congress with Stephen Texter, a nephrologist who uh, studies hypertension at Mayo Clinic, about 
whether or not living donors, or whether or not people with hypertension could be living donors. And he said, I showed up with strong convictions, he showed up with stronger data, and I lost. <laughs> the data basically says that in Caucasians, single drug, well controlled hypertension, if you're 50 or older, some would say 45, there's some data out to around five years to suggest that it's safe to proceed with donation in that cohort. And I can tell you, I just uh, did an effect me. I'm pretty uncomfortable. We decide as a group, a 34-year-old multiracial woman who's you know on two drugs with a normal 24-hour blood pressure monitor, but two drugs. Uh, and you know, I, I think the type of thing that bothers me as I think about decision making in advising living donors and educating them is there's virtually no data at all for me to tell her what her risk is. And so I think that um, we'll come to it, but I benefit from doing that surgery. <clears throat> it pays my salary. It makes my boss happy. It makes the institution happy. We do fewer living donors. If we trend down for a month or two, somebody gets a call and it's like, hey, what's going on? You know, what are you doing? Because it's built into the budget. And I think that's the uncomfortable tension. Um, when you look at new onset of hypertension and diabetes after donation, Again, it's the same factors. Here it's older, male, increased BMI um, related, increased risk of developing hypertension. Less likely in the Hispanic Latino population. I thought this was interesting. Spouse actually confers a greater risk than a first degree relative, but as you think about it, it's probably lifestyle related. I can imagine that diet, exercise, things like that tend to kind of cluster in a household. And you see similar things with diabetes. The difference is there the risk is greater in the Hispanic Latino population. Um, when you look at obesity and donation, I remember when I showed up at uh, Emory and as I said, Ken and I were trying to come up with a living donor program. Before that was just kind of ad hoc. It was largely done by a guy who was a general surgeon and kind of the nephrologist of the day and there were no criteria. And we decided we should have a BMI cutoff. So we pulled out a paper from the New England Journal that just looked at um, body mass index and mortality and discovered about 35 it takes off. So we decided, well, that's a bad idea. We shouldn't do 35, above 35. So we did that and then we spent a lot of time trying to get people who were 37, 38, 40 to lose weight to 35. We felt better about ourselves. Um, but when that's actually been studied, everybody goes back to where they were. So it doesn't really do much. Part of what was driving our decision, other than that simple graphic in the New England Journal paper, was the understanding that with obesity in donors comes an increased lifetime risk of hypertension and diabetes, two of the very things that contribute to kidney failure in about half of the donors who do develop kidney failure. That said, when you look at it, a lot of the other complications that you might um, anticipate are the same. Uh, the risk of ESRD is the same and GFR over time is the same. So it's a little hard to actually justify that, I think, in today's world. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. It basically says the same thing, that there was really no difference in kidney function in patients who gained weight after transplant. So I'll conclude that by saying I think that when you compare 2019 to 2009, we're now pretty, it's pretty clear that there are risks of ESRD that are increased by the act of living donation, that those are not uniform across the population, and that we need to do a better job educating people and uh, following people at risk, and I'll come back to that. As a surgeon, you've got to say, well, maybe the risk, maybe a big disincentive is fear of a bad outcome. And I'm going to make this really short because it's not true. It's not the surgeons. Um, so this looks at um, readmission to the hospital. Um, you can see low rates after living donation. You look at complications reported at either by discharge six months or 12 months. And I tell people there's about a 7% chance in my mind that something can happen to you that I can put an ICD code, an ICD-9 code to, or 10 maybe now. Um, but most of that's really minor. The number of really serious things that happen is small. I've probably done now about 800 lap donors. I've um, reoperated on one person. Most of the people we readmit, we readmit for constipation. Um, 
as simple as that, and that's a small number. So it's overall been a very safe operation. I'm aware of a couple cases at Emory, one splenectomy, one incidental um, injury to small bowel that required a resection, but I mean, probably my partners have done as many as I have, so out of maybe 1,500 lap donors, I don't think we've reoperated on more than five. And so um, it's been a safe operation. I don't think that's the issue. When you look at those things that do happen, only about half of them are medical problems. You know, there's malignancies and suicides and accidents and things like that. So even when you look at the rate of the risk of death over a year, only half of that's really, I think, directly attributable to the surgery itself. And again, trying to make it simple for patients, this is from Jesse Schold, and he's just looking at procedure-related complications and length of stay, comparing donor nephrectomy to cholecystectomy, appendectomy, or nephrectomy for cancer. And you can see it's about like an uh, appendectomy or cholecystectomy. When you look at, um, what was I going to say? Uh, readmission rates, it's actually a little bit lower for living donor. So it helps people. Most people know somebody who's had a cholecystectomy or an appendectomy. You can say it's a serious surgery, but that's kind of in terms of surgical risk about what you're looking at. Um, something that became apparent a few years ago are the financial risks. And I think that when basically everyone's 401k tanked and people were getting laid off and, you know, you couldn't sell a house to save your life, money people begin to think about that. And so this is a woman from Wisconsin who donated to a friend, and she uh, is a landscaper, and it cost her over $5,000 out-of-pocket expenses to donate. So that's a pretty significant disincentive. Um, and this is, I alluded to this a little bit, who benefits? Well, the recipient of the kidney benefits, that's the best for them public and private payers, because, you know, transplant turns out to be cheaper than dialysis. The transplant professionals, the employers, people can go back to work in society because our tax dollars don't go to pay for more expensive therapies. Who pays is really, it turns out, the prospective donor. When you look at how they pay, lost wages is a huge part. A lot of people, they don't show up and don't work. They don't get paid. Um, and then you start thinking, they're using paid sick time. They're using vacation days. That's really taking money out of their pocket as well. There are issues you're not supposed to uh, make decisions about insurability for former donors, but it's happened. Employment stability, you know, yeah, you can take off, Ken, but, you know, we're not going to hold your job for you. <clears throat> so losing your job is a big problem. Then there's direct costs, transportation, food, um, dependent elder care, things like that. There are some um, ways that people can receive compensation for some of this, and we'll talk about it just a little bit. I thought tax credits were interesting. Early on, when Ken and I were uh, just starting the program, the governor, they had a donor day at the Capitol, so I figured, well, I run the living donor program, I ought to go down there. After I realized that you can't carry a pocket knife in because I kept setting off the alarm, they looked at me and decided I was pretty harmless, let me take it in. But um, nonetheless, the government's standing on the steps and he announces that there's a tax credit for all living donors. And it's like, gee, that's kind of like a financial, maybe not inducement, but you're definitely paying people who were donors, and that kind of seemed to fly in the face of NODA. Nonetheless, the government did it, and there are a number of states that do that. So I think a lot of times we make a lot about something saying, oh, it can't be done or we'll get in trouble. And in truth, the people who just do it, there's sometimes not that big a consequence. Certainly there wasn't for the government or the governor, and there are a number of states that now do that. Um, so this is a uh, living donor study group. And one of the things they tried to look at was expenses. And I'm just going to go to this. So these are pre-donation expenses. These are just I show up and want to be a donor. And you can see it's a spectrum. It's not huge. But there are a number of people who had significant expenses, largely related to travel, lodging, child care, things like that. Then post-donation, again, pretty substantial chunk. So 20% of people were coming up with over $5,000 of expenses. And that's a hardship. I suspect, you know, most physicians sitting in this room would say, well, I don't want to spend $5,000 that way, but I can. I'll do it for my brother or my friend. But there are a lot of families where this would be a real hardship. <clears throat> so this is a paper from Bob Gaston. Bob was always ahead of the curve. He published this in 2006. We rediscovered this, you know, kind of financial concern. Uh, Dan Solomon, the president of the AST the year before me, hosted a meeting 
and we thought this is all important and we got all excited about it and we were going to solve the problem and then we looked and saw Bob had been fighting with us for over a decade already. But this is what he proposed. He proposed that donors should be compensated somewhere around twenty to thirty thousand dollars and he breaks it down you know you think about if you don't have death you know, life insurance, health insurance, things like that. He wasn't talking about forever but at least for one year so that if I donate my family's not left destitute if something terrible happens to me. The thing that was really um, controversial was this kind of compensation for inconvenience anxiety, kind of a cover all. We know some stuff happens, we don't know how to do it. And that began to look a bit like a payment. Um, but Bob viewed this in a way I did, I'd never appreciated. He said, if this is net financial neutrality, we're not talking about giving the donors money to make it a positive. They're losing money, and we're talking about giving them money to make their loss less. And I think this made it a much more palatable thing to consider actually allowing the transfer of funds from some source to donors to uh, offset the costs of living donation. So Dan Solomon and our group engaged um, our community with a survey, and basically 70% of people thought that donors should have no out-of-pocket expenses and that giving them money to offset this was fine. Some thought frank payments were okay, that was a s smaller group. Um, but pretty much everybody thought that you should not pay to be a living donor. Um, same um, thing, a group in Canada studied the same question, but they extended it to look at public. So they said health professionals, yes. What about the public and what about people with kidney disease? Not surprisingly, if you look here, reimbursement of all lost wages regardless of income to donor or reimbursement somewhat dependent on uh, your income. Bill Gates probably doesn't need support as much as somebody living in Dunlap would. But pretty much everybody, again, uniformly was supportive, including the public. Um, what tools are there? We hear a lot about NELDAC. So NELDAC started as a grant from HRSA which has historically wanted to avoid anything to do with living donation, being the government, their concern is, well, if we promote living donation, then it turns out to be a bad thing, meaning people are harmed, we'll look bad, and we're a government agency, we don't look bad. But they did give a grant to the American Society of Transplant Surgeons to run a pilot program to try to offset some of the costs. So this has helped a lot of people, but it's very restrictive. It's the payer of last resort. You have to show need. And if you basically, you have to be below three times the poverty level to even qualify for this. And it's limited not to lost wages or things like that, basically to lodges, lodging, traveling, lodging and travel expenses. Can't exceed a $6,000 cost. Nonetheless, um, I think, and I lost track of the number, but they looked at something like 3,000 people who'd benefited, or no, I'm sorry, um, they looked at, yeah, over 3,000 applications, 2,000 funded, and 50% of the people said that the small amount of money they received from NALDAC allowed them to donate. Without that, they would have decided they couldn't afford to. So it is a real problem. How do you pay for this? Um, this is an interesting study from Scott Clarenbach, a health economist, nephrologist in Canada, <clears throat> and he points out that 1.2% of all healthcare expenditure in Canada is spent on people with ESRD, even though it's less than 0.09 or it's 0.09% .09 of the population. So he argues there's some money out there that could be used and that transplant actually saves money. This just shows the cost for various types of dialysis relative to transplant. And the insurers have figured this out. Like United Healthcare and Optum have figured out very rapidly about 70% of their patients that they insure get preemptive transplants. I don't know how that's done, or get living donor transplants, I should say, and a big chunk of those are preemptive. But they really support education and poor financial resources in that because they save a fortune. They figure that over three years they save about $500,000 if they can do a preemptive transplant, which is why we worked with Optum and they now provide a lot of reimbursement for donor expenses. Their point is, you know, if I, support Ken to the tune of $10,000 so he can be a donor. I'm still up about $490,000 on this. Now you gotta take out the cost of the transplant app, but it's, it's for them a no-brainer. So it's one of the rare things, times when doing the right thing is also doing the correct thing. Um, there are ways, I'm gonna skip over this. This is a very controversial paper. Um, 
<clears throat> that basically says you should pay donors somewhere around $45,000 and that you could solve the organ shortage um, <clears throat> by simply paying people a somewhat outrageous fund, but that the government would make money and society would save money on this. Um, you run into a couple problems. This is a paper that was written in response um, years ago to the concept of reimbursing donors. And it's, um, what I want to say, the Declaration of Istanbul. So this is really about transplant tourism. It's about countries where um, poor people are encouraged to donate for what seems like a lot of money but isn't really life-altering for them so that rich people can benefit and people travel from outside to get that. And that's certainly um, human organ trafficking is, you know, no one really supports that in um, countries like America. But it shouldn't be confused with reimbursing lost wages. When you actually read through the Declaration of Istanbul itself, it says in there that reimbursement for all reasonable costs is right and appropriate, and in point of fact is a moral imperative. And they go so far as to say that also uh, lifetime access to health care is um, mandated for all living donors. So it actually goes further than we do. Um, so this is not a reason not to reimburse donors. Um, what notice us? So Al Gore was uh, one of the co-sponsors of NOTA, and everybody's always saying, well, NOTA says that you can't pay donors. NOTA doesn't say that. And when you t look at the actual terms, valuable consideration does not include reasonable payments associated with removal, transportation, implantation, meaning we and the OPOs all get paid, processing, preservation. But it also goes on to travel expenses, lost wages. So the people who say, oh, NOTA won't allow you to do this, you know, you'll go to jail if you, you know, do this. It's actually not true if you look at it. And there's proof of that. These are a couple groups that actually pay lost wages to donors. Pretty much everybody's okay with travel expenses and lodging, meals, things like that. But where lost wages is the big thing. But there are already groups doing that, and no one's ever uh, filed suit against them. So <clears throat> um, the next thing I wanted to mention quickly, and I... Yeah, um, this is a paper that we wrote a few years ago. I think one of the big problems is we said, we don't have any data around higher risk groups at long-term time points. So while sitting around coming back from a meeting at HRSA at the uh, bar in Reagan Airport, two of my friends and I came up with this idea, we'll just give everybody Medicare. We'll call it a study. Um, so what we're going to say is we're going to enroll you in a clinical study which is lifetime follow-up as a living donor, and we will offset that or compensate you by providing you access to Medicare at the time you donate. Now, most people don't want Medicare. If I offered that to you guys, you'd be like, yeah, well, that's not too useful to me. But there are a number of people where it would be helpful, and the goal was to generate lifetime follow-up on everybody. To us, this seemed like a pretty innocuous proposal. Um, in point of fact, it created a great stir, and there were scathing reviews of our idea and how we were you know, trying to take advantage of economically less fortunate people. I still think, though, that if we are going to allow people who have risks for kidney failure that we don't fully understand, I can't tell them what the risk is. The only way to do that is to follow them for life. So this donor that I just did that I mentioned to you that I was a little worried about, the hypertensive younger person, I talked to Tony Guash and I said, I will do this on one condition, which is you take care of her for the duration of your time here at Emory. You know, I want her to come back every year and see you, not for two years, but, um, and I, I think that we need to start um, doing that in a operational way, not a one-off, but making sure that people have access to health care somehow. Um, the NKR, I was gonna talk about paired exchange, I'm gonna skip over it really quickly, but they've done a lot of things. So Garrett Hill is a real innovator. So one of the things he's done is anybody who donates through their program, if that donor develops kidney failure, they get prioritized to get a kidney back from the program. Um, they ensure that you're not billed for any complications related to the surgery. They will cover it, and how they cover it is kind of they pass the cost on to the participating centers. But nonetheless, that won't happen. They provide legal support. If you lose your job, if you can't be insured, they'll get lawyers for you. Um, they provide insurance, short-term insurance, life and disability. They reimburse lost wages. So this is a group, they're doing about 500 transplants a year, and this is now in place. They do it every day. 
I think this is really innovative. It shows it can be done. And I think, to me, this is kind of inspirational. I'm going to finish by talking about racial disparities. You can't practice probably for you guys, certainly in Atlanta. We transplant more African-American uh, patients than any program in the country. About two-thirds of our transplants are in African-Americans. And there are some real disparities. So it was interesting when you look, the incidence of CKD is the same in African-Americans and Caucasians. What's different is advanced CKD, um, which is much more common in the African-American population. Not news to you guys. Um, shows the same thing. Shows the kidney waiting list is about the same African-Americans and Caucasians, but your likelihood of getting a transplant if you're African-American is much lower. This is from Rachel Patzer. She has a uh, group, a consortium, the Southeast Society's Disparities. And when you look at preemptive referral, placement on the deceased donor waiting list, or getting a living donor kidney transplant, if you're African-American, you're much less likely to have any of those good things happen to you. Um, I'm going to skip that. So that brings us to APOL1. Um, Dan Solomon, when he was president, he was a nephrologist at Scripps. Um, people kept emailing him saying, what's the ASC doing about this? And he's like, well, I've got too many things on my plate now. And he suggested I do it. Well, I'm a surgeon, so I kind of ignored that, like I do many things I'm not interested in or informed about, until I went to a, my wife's meeting, and I was sitting around bored, and I went to a coffee shop and said, oh, let's do something. So we planned a consensus conference, but it caused me to first try to understand what it is. So it's one of the first genetic uh, polymorphisms to be associated, single polymorphisms, with a disease. Um, and this is a paper from Science in 2010 from Marty Pollack at uh, Brigham, and, or I think Beth Israel Deaconess. But it's not all kidney disease. It's just certain kidney diseases. Um, I'm going to skip that, skip this for a second. <clears throat> so this is what having the ApoL1 variant is. So there are two variants in this apolipoprotein 1 gene. It's kind of an interesting gene. Like sickle cell, it arose in sub-Saharan Africa about 10,000 years ago, and it confers protection against um, the trypanosome that causes African sleeping sickness. You have one copy of this gene, you're resistant. You can't get sleeping sickness, you survive. You have two copies of the gene, you still survive. You're still resistant to the disease. Um, but your risk of kidney disease goes up significantly. And it's just some. So if you look, at, it's uh, sickle cell hypertension. FSGS is the big one that everybody thinks about in HVAN. Um, so this is where Stephen Texter, when he came down and talked to us, um, was very helpful, the guy from uh, Mayo. He was saying, I'm not sure that hypertension in African Americans is any different than it is in Caucasians. His point was that likely this gene associates with people who develop kidney failure. You show up at Grady with hypertension, kidney failure, before we knew about this gene, and it's still not routinely tested, um, we attribute their kidney failure to hypertension. And the real question is, is hypertension any different if you take this into account? That said and done. So it's a risk for CKD and ESRD. The study I skipped over, though, showed that in population basis, although your relative risk increases greatly, the majority of people with two variants, and about 13% of African Americans have two variants, so they're at risk. But the majority of people will live a normal life and have no problem at all. So it's kind of confusing. I know your risk is increased statistically, but you're still probably going to be fine. So where this really, to me, comes into play is living donation. This is simply a study that shows if you looked at deceased donors who had two variants of ApoL1, the risk of kidney failure was much greater than donors who had zero or one risk. So you say, well, if the donated kidney survives less well, what happens in the setting of living donation where a donor has two risk variants? And that was the real thing that got me interested in this. Um, I'm going to, this basically is a little bit tangential, but what it says is you can, if you, for those of you who do transplant, you're familiar with KDPI. It's, I mentioned to you, it predicts the uh, longevity of kidneys from deceased organ donors. And one of the strongest drivers in that is African American race. Um, and this is a paper from Bruce Julian, Bob Gaston, uh, Barry Friedman, that says in truth you can actually get even more power by replacing race with this apolipoprotein 1 uh, polymorphisms. So instead of saying all black donors have an increased risk of um, or their donated kidneys have a shortened survival, 
you could now be more precise. Some people were worried about that, but what it says is 87% of all donors, actually the African-American donors, their kidneys will perform better. So it helps with the matching and allocation. And I think gets away from race and gets to true biologically measurable variables. Um, prior to the meeting we held, there were two cases of living donors who had developed a FSGS type kidney failure following donation. Um, that, and they went back and genotyped them, and they were both had two variants of ApoL1. So that was about what we knew. I'm going to skip the details of those cases. Um, and back in 11, a group from um, Oregon Health Sciences Center wrote a paper that basically said, we don't know what to do with it, but you should measure it in all African-American donors, and you should consider it in making a decision about donation, yes or no. Um, so we had held a meeting. Um, it was attended by five groups from the NIH, the leaders in the field of disparities, um, living donation, and we came up with basically the same conclusions about six years later. So maybe it wasn't a huge advance there, but what it did do is put together a group from the NIH um, to start this Apollo study, and I'll mention that. I'm trying to get Ken to participate, although I understand it's a challenge. Um, so in today's world, what we can do is we can ignore ApoL1, say we just don't know enough about it. That seems like kind of putting your head in the sand. Certainly if I was African American, I donated, developed kidney failure, I got tested, and I saw I had two variants, I'd be kind of frustrated, no one mentioned it to me. You can simply screen everybody and rule out everybody who has two variants, or you can do what I think makes the most sense, which is use it like we use everything else, you know, as one factor in helping make a decision and helping educate patients. Um, I think if you have a 20-year-old donating to his brother who has hypertensive kidney failure and he's got two variants, I'd be pretty worried about it, probably wouldn't be too excited. You show me a 60-year-old with structural and normal kidneys, no hypertension, no proteinuria, good GFR, I'd say whatever, they're not going to live long enough to run into troubles related to this polymorphism. When we did a survey of what centers did back in 2000, I guess this was 16, basically half of the people, not half, but a fraction weren't even aware that you could test for it, and the majority didn't because they didn't know what to do with it. That said, if you gave them the scenario I just gave you, the 20-year-old, they'd all say, hmm, probably wouldn't do it. So it's kind of interesting. You know, we don't know we could do it. If we knew we could do it, we wouldn't do it, except if we knew the results, we'd then exclude someone. So the logic kind of escaped me, but that's how we practice. This is a really good paper from Jamie Locke, and it goes through, I won't go through all the details, but it looks at all the risk factors. And you can see, so you know, if you say somebody with um, impaired glucose tolerance, family history of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, EGFR, when you layer in ApoL1 variants, it becomes a really profound impact. So if you look at people with family history of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, all that, and you add in two risk factors, you're up to about a 10% risk. So I think this is where it's not if you take somebody with no risk factors and add in ApoL1, it doesn't really do much. So I think it really argues for the fact that we need to weigh multiple variables. Um, a recent paper came out from Mona Doshi at uh, Henry Ford now at Michigan, but she went back and typed living donors um, for ApoL1. And I think it was 100 and some living donors. But what you see is their um, mean GFR wasn't that different between the high and low risk post-donation, but when you looked at the groups with impaired, so the high risk group, two risk factors, these are just regular African American living kidney donors who all met the criteria to donate. Went back and looked, those with the kind of higher stage CKD were clustered with the risk variant. So that does cause, I think, uh, this is the first evidence that we should be a little more concerned about this. And then when you look at the slope of GFR over time, the high risk confers low greater risk. This is just a paper to say, we want to make it easy, especially as surgeons. Here's ApoL1, you know, it's like, oh, we test for that, we're good. There are all sorts of variants associated with um, race that are probably, or that have been reported to impact uh, kidney health over time. So it may not be so simple as looking at one gene. 
a plug for the Apollo study. The only good thing to come out of that meeting we did is the NIH started a study where they're trying to enroll every donor um, of African American ancestry in a study to track the <laughs> outcomes of those kidneys so they can really determine what is the impact of ApoL1 for both deceased and living donors and their recipients. So this brings me to the end. Pretty good, like 90 slides in about 50 minutes. Um, but I think life is all about understanding and mitigating risk. So Ken got me into riding motorcycles. And I went to the Harley store and I bought about $1,000 worth of apparel, dragged the bags over for my rider safety class. He said I had to do a rider safety class. And there's this kind of uh, rugged looking guy standing in the front. He said, make no mistakes, riding's not as safe as driving. If you choose to ride, you're accepting risk. Um, we're here to help you minimize that risk, but, but we can't make the risk go away. So if any of you are uncomfortable, take your stuff back and we'll refund it and no harm, no foul. And, and I think that that's a good model for living donation, a lot of choices we make in life. Our job as physicians is to not make decisions for our patients, but to help educate them about what the consequences of their decision are and strategies to minimize those risks should they choose to go ahead. So um, this is a picture of us going riding. And this is Tony Guash, one of our other nephrologists, probably about the only three people in medicine to be riding motorcycles through Atlanta. But not one of our best decisions, but we're still alive. Um, so I'll conclude by saying I think there are a lot of things that influence your risk of developing CKD or ESRD, and we've talked about those ad nauseum um, in, in the general population. Those factors are probably equally important or more so in former living kidney donors. I think that we now have tools that we didn't have a decade ago so that we can actually inform patients about their individual risk. As my friend from Vancouver says, I don't want to know general risk. I want to know risk for people like me. Um, I think that we then need to uh, develop practices and procedures that help people manage their health long term. So long term follow up I feel really strongly about particularly around um, the more medically complex living donor. So I'll stop there. Thank you again for inviting me up here. I enjoyed my time. Thank you very much, Professor. I want to introduce one of our questions. So Ken, one of the big barriers for following up these living donors is uh, reimbursement as time goes by. So, you know, we see them out to two years, but after that, what is the, you know, there's not much of an incentive for physicians to follow them. Has AST or the government done any work to try and make that easier for people? No, I think it's going to require an analysis, much like Scott Clarenbeck did. So healthcare systems and insurers, I really believe it falls on insurers. I told you that a private insurer saves, with a preemptive transplant, about half a million dollars. And they use that money, they want that money. I understand that, but you could give some of that money back. In truth, health care for healthy people, you know, a simple office visit, blood pressure, proteinuria, you know, some simple labs would not cost that much. And so I think that what you have to do is take some of the savings to the health care system and invest that back in supporting the doctors who follow the patients. And then we create data. The real reason to do that is twofold. One is you may be able to preemptively slow or prevent the progression of CKD, but we also generate data that then helps inform people and hopefully allows more people to donate. It's less than it used to be, but yes. Okay. And, you know, based on what you're, what you're saying about the risk, I think at least maybe 20% are under uh, 30 based on these statistics, something roughly like that. You know, is that something that you should give in the data that, that those younger patients are higher risk for ESRD, that, that those patients you think potentially should be discouraged? Or is that, I think, I'm imagining that's just one of the things that you're going to talk about. I, I I think it goes back to a little bit to autonomy. So if I'm 20 and perfectly healthy, I'm not sure that it's Ken's job to tell me I can't be a donor. It's Ken's job to understand 
to help me understand what my risks are. One of those risks is my younger age. But then also to help come up with a strategy, you know, at 25, no one feels they need health insurance. They don't go to doctors. I mean, my son refused to buy health insurance. I said, why would I do that? That's stupid. I think we need to educate them that they're making a decision that impacts their life long term. And we need to assess whether they have the emotional maturity to actually engage in appropriate medical follow-up and maintain a lifestyle that, you know, avoids risk factors for CKD. So I don't see that we exclude them. I don't think that's appropriate. But I think we have to talk to them about the risk and, again, encourage them to adopt uh, kind of lifestyle issues that minimize their risk.